You guys been delighting yourself? For you, you folks that didn't hear that last week, I, I, I did a little teaching, something that I had never seen before, kind of a, a fresh revelation where God speaks to us to tell us to delight ourselves and, and basically recognize his greatness and love to us, which is pure delight. And we should delight ourselves and, and look at all the great things that we have available to us and, and the great benefits. And one of the things I, one of the, I, I guess you guys could see the, the new pictures here. These are pictures that I took out in Colorado. And uh, this is, this was done, these were done, let's see. This was done on a, on a dirt road between Crested Butte and Paonia, which are two little towns I spent some time in and and then that one was done on a on a mountain pass on, on my way from our cabin to Telluride and a and a and a uh, I guess what we call that it's a um, mountain road it's dirt rock stone gets pretty rough at times it gets about Sometimes it gets five feet wide, sometimes it's 10 feet. But anyways, that's, those are the aspen trees that were turning yellow. I did a deplorable job mounting the plastic onto the styrofoam, but hopefully you can't see it back there. Anyways, I want to talk to you in just a few minutes here. don't want to take too much time with it about the... Making making of discipleship disciples, you know this is this is the discipleship is an amazingly powerful tool, and the fivefold ministry was given to the body to make disciples, and and uh, who, who eventually can become part of the fivefold ministry, and however it goes, but discipling is is. Uh, basically, a disciple is, is a follower of Christ. That's basically the, the, the simplest uh, way that I can define it. And uh, that's my role. And, you know, I, I, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking that I, I started getting really serious with God when I was 25 years old. You know, I... I tried to serve God, tried to do some right things, and then I, I, I just didn't get it. I, I just wasn't getting it. I don't know what I wasn't getting, but I, well, I wasn't getting anything about God. I was, I was reading about things and I was listening to it at the Bible college I, I started out with, and and eventually I just, you know, I through a process of going through a lot of different things, and ending up going to Miami University, and I. I spent a little time at Ohio State, and, but I ended up graduating from Miami, and then I ended up coming home. And when I got to be about 25, uh, I got serious with God. I got serious. I didn't know anything about it, but I got serious. I no longer was playing games. I didn't go play with my buddies playing their softball on their, all the stuff that goes down. I just didn't do that. It just wasn't me anymore because I, I, I was serious about the things of God. I was trying to start a business, but, but I was also really burying myself in the Word, and I, I, I wanted to have, I, 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 I guess the best way to say that is I knew there was something out there and I just couldn't get my hands on it. I, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to reach. But I knew there was something different. And I can't tell you how I knew that. I had never been told that. Nobody had ever instructed me on it. Whether it was a, uh, whether it was a, um, uh, 
intellectual doctorate of Greek that I said under at Moody or whether it was, you know, the, the, the lowest drug dealer that I dealt with when I lived in Chicago. I mean, I, and I worked in the ghetto. I worked in, uh, I worked in Skid Row. Uh, that was part of my work study program. But uh, whatever it was and whatever I had learned, there was something there I couldn't get my, couldn't get my hands on. I couldn't get my mind wrapped around it. And I struggled and I struggled. But when I hit 25 and I had that experience with the Lord, when I was running around looking and talking to every religious person in the city that had any kind of leadership ability, and I could not get, I was just as frustrated doing that as I was my, from 18 to 25, when I was really digging, or I thought I was. But when I hit 25 and then I came back and I really, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I was committed. I w I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a difference and I'm gonna do whatever it takes to see success in my life, it, with God and with business and with everything. I wanted, I wanted to have success, but I knew the spearhead of the whole thing was God. I knew that was the deal. I had to get that, and without that, there wasn't there wasn't much value. I mean, I, I knew rich people that didn't know God at all. I knew rich people who went to church every week, and not any of them was. They're all they're, they seemed like they were both lost to me. I couldn't see any difference in the world and the man that went to church every Sunday and 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 claimed to, you know, I don't know what it, what they claimed. I I just know where they went to church. They were a very well known church in city here and. And uh, uh, they spoke and preached the born again experience every Sunday. And but I didn't see anything there, and I said, "Man, God, I don't know, man. This this just can't be God. It just can't be." And when I was twenty five, then, and I had recommitted my heart to the Lord, I got baptized again, did that whole meal. Don't know that I needed to, I just did it. And I just said, there's got to be something different. And by the time I was 28 years old, I was going to give up on God. I was done. I couldn't find anybody to give me anything that gave me any peace. Nothing that would give me knowledge that my head would understand it. Well, I didn't know nothing about a soul and a spirit. So all I knew is... I mean, I didn't know what born again was. I mean, I knew what they told me, but I didn't, I didn't know what, how to explain it to anybody. They, I just told them, you got to be born again. Marvel not what I say to you, you got to be born again. That's all I knew what to say, but I didn't know what, I didn't know what it meant. Didn't know, didn't know what the heck that represented. And now I'm 28 years old, and I'm telling you, I, I am the most frustrated person in the universe, and I... And I, that's when I had, was down in my basement and, and I was weeping. It was weeping from not knowing, being frustrated, not knowing what the heck is going on and not knowing how to get it. Now I'm reading the Bible and I'm getting some really neat things and some things are changing and it seemed like God's beginning to talk to me about my business and I started, I started the pathway that, that he had directed me to do, at least I thought it was, you know, but I, there was something else. There was just something more. I hadn't been filled with the Spirit yet. I just knew there was something else. There was something else. And I was moving into the business world. But see, I, I knew a lot of Christians that had been fairly successful in business, so I knew that wasn't totally the answer. I think I'm listening to God. I think I'm trying to do what He's telling me to do. But I just don't know what that answer is that's leaving me so empty. And I always thought and heard, well, you know, when you get born again, you got, God fills that big void. Well, my void wasn't filled. So then you begin to doubt your salvation. You're not sure quite exactly what's going on. You, 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 you're re and I've been reading in here and has been talking about tongues and interpretation. I've been reading in here about, about healing. I've been reading in here about Jesus walking the earth. And I'm trying to think, you know, I've, if we just, if, 
It just seems like all I ever hear is the history of what Jesus did back then. That's what was preached in the church, what, what Jesus did. Like, that's really wonderful. But what does that have to do with me? How do, how do I relate to that? I got myself born again, and I said, is that it? So it's just a matter of going to church every Sunday and getting hearing about being born again. Hearing about being born again. Hear about being, that's what I was, that's the cycle I was going through. And it's just going around and around and around. And one day, God performed a miracle in my life. I wasn't looking for it. Didn't know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you hear people talking about it. But, you know, I didn't know I, I could relate to it. I didn't know it was for today. You hear about history once again. You have preachers that are history teachers. You know, they need to be, they need to be disciple makers. Because I'm not here to tell you guys about history. I'm here to tell you how to change your life. And what I'm telling you, it's a real deal. And I still don't hear it out there because they're all playing games. They're all screwing around, dinking around, trying to make money, trying to have a vacation home in Florida or whatever they're doing. Trying to, trying to, most of them are lazy and they sit at home all day long and don't do nothing. I'm talking about the pastors. And I just didn't have an answer. So I, I went down to my basement that morning and I had a new American Standard Bible that was I, in two years or the, maybe, maybe three, I'd worn it out. It was duct taped together it was, and, and scotch taped. The pages were scotch taped and the, and the cover and the inside cover was duct taped. And that's, that's what I was reading. I still got it. Hard to read. But I still got it. And I was standing up behind my desk, and I was weeping before God. But I wasn't weeping from fear. I wasn't weeping from pain. I wasn't weeping because my heart was broke. I was weeping because I was totally, unequivocally. Have you ever been in a fight with somebody that you dearly love, and you're, and you're trying to tell them something, and they won't listen? And, you, and, and it's just driving you bananas. You want to get this across to them. You ever had that? Yep. You know what, how frustrating that is? Maybe it's your wife or a friend, kids. And you're totally frustrated. And it's like you want to go knock your head against the wall yeah. or run your fist in it or kick the dog or spank the kids. You, 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 you're totally frustrated and you have no clue how to deal with it because somebody else has got a free will and, and you think your way is right. And it's better than that other person's way. That's where I was at. That frustration, that's where I was at. But I didn't have anybody I was directing it to except God. And how do you direct it toward Him? I've never seen him, never touched him, never tasted him, never heard him. None, none of my five senses ever dealt with it. And that's all I understood. I couldn't, get it, I couldn't get that wrapped up around my head. And so all I had was frustration, and I was just bringing tears to my eyes. And I just threw that book down, and that book fell open. I'm in a dark area of my basement. It's a, a, all unfinished except one little 12 by 12 area that I finished as a little office I could go down and sit down. To, and a light shined from somewhere. And it shined on a page on that Bible where it fell open. And you know, I wasn't going, well, I wonder where that light comes from. <laughs> you know, I w that wasn't what I was doing. I was like, I'm, I'm like, and I'm reading it, and it says there's an anointing in you, son, and you don't have need of any man to teach you, but that anointing will teach you when you need to know it. I was free. It's free. 
two seconds. 28 years. I was free. And I've been free ever since. I have not been frustrated one time. Because I know that I know that I know that was God. I can wrap my head around it. And I know that if I just dig a little harder, I'll find the answer. But I didn't know that before then. I just was digging. But it didn't seem like I was going anywhere. I was learning a lot of stuff, but I didn't know if I could believe in it. Do you know what you do in your life? If you allow some pastor or some teacher or some person convince you that there's something in this book that is not for today, how do you have confidence in anything? Who is the man that's smart enough to decide what that one is? And I heard that all my life. I mean, Wayne, Wayne has come from the, the German Baptist persuasion. And, of course, my, my mom came from that, but they weren't in that. They were Baptists, okay? Not the German Baptists, but the word Obama's. That's where my grandfather was from. And, but they tell us that. They, that's kind of what I learned most of my life and that and I look at these men now and my heart hurts for these people my heart breaks you know why they you have when you're in that kind of a mindset you have to get to a place where something becomes your normal and you just accept it and this is my norm and this is where I stay We've talked about normal in here all several times. Everybody has their normal. This is what I want to tell you guys. God has you here for a reason. This, this is like that light. That's what you guys are. God, God generated a light that brought you here. It's that light that I had. See, you guys just know me as this little tiny builder here and little tiny lima and little, little tiny nothing going on and nothing. But see, I don't see myself that way. I see myself as a world changer. I don't see myself as, as my age. I see myself as a world changer. I see myself as timeless. I can live to be 120 years old because God promised it to us. Now, you, you want your normal to be whatever your aunt and uncles did, you know, and so-and-so died at 50, and another one died of cancer, and another one died of this problem and that problem, and you know how it is. It's generational. Well, I got, a, I got a word for you guys that got this generational thing going on. That's a curse. And Galatians 3.13 says, I've redeemed you from the curse of the law. There's no longer generational issues in your life. Whatever you had in your life, whatever your parents taught you, whatever your grandparents taught you, whatever anybody said to you that, brought, that, that changed you and caused you to go maybe a wrong way or something, it's over. It's gone. Because I just told you it was. I just made you aware of what the Word of God says. And He has redeemed us. He took our place. Mm -hmm. So whatever it was, whatever you went through, whatever struggle you had, whatever, I don't care what it is. I don't care where you are. I don't care how you got to where you are. That's over. And now I'm making disciples. That road that you traveled on, and I don't care how old you are, any more than I care how old I am. That road you traveled on, when God said he redeemed you, it disappeared. Can you hear him speaking to you? When he says, old things have passed away, behold, all things 
Amen. I become new. Because he redeemed you. And that's gone. Now you can drag it back if you want. And you have the right to do that. But you don't have to. But if you want that to change, and you want that to no, no longer drag you back into it, because the Bible says a dog returns to his vomit. You can go back there. Or you can walk in the newness. That's what I'm doing here. I'm making disciples. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I may not be telling you all the, all the truth, but all that I'm telling you is truth. It's stuff I've walked in. Because I had that experience. And I asked him, to direct my path. And he showed me miracle after miracle, physically, financially, maritally, in every area. He's given me that. And God says, I'm going to make, have you make disciples. That's what he told me. Because when I first got into this, I had no clue what I was going to do. But now I know. And anybody that wants change of life, that wants to not be what they were, not be and do what they've experienced, to get away and make a break, and to know that there's hope, and to know that there's no restrictions, and to know that there's nothing impossible unto him who believes. That's discipleship. You have to believe. you got to break away from flesh, understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your understanding. You got to break away from that. You got to break away from whatever it is you, you, you have in your past. God says, I want you to break away. I don't want you to go back there anymore because you got something better to do. I've got a job for you guys to do. And it's going to be incredible. And the only way you don't believe that is if you look back on your life and say, well, look at me. Why didn't I a mess? Well, it's hard to look incredible for the future if you're looking back. He said, that, I don't want you to look back. Did I not tell you that old things have all things have passed away? Old things? I know, I know you still got your brain, but I'm telling you, to renew your mind and prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. That's what he says to do. I know you got that still in your mind, but get rid of it. And if you'll read this word, and that's what I was doing, and that's what God taught me, and that's what helped set me free. Because I knew there was an answer now, and I knew where to get it. And I knew if I just dug at it long enough, because he taught me, the first thing he taught me was, the word of God is like a hidden treasure. If I tell you there's one in your backyard, you go out there and decide, well, I'm going to go out there and dig for about an hour. I don't find nothing. Now I didn't hear from God. I, I didn't hear from God. So you dig for a little bit. Sure enough, I'm tired. Didn't find no treasure. I must be an idiot. Now I've got to fix this mess I just made. <laughs> See, I said the Word of God is like a hidden treasure. All he's asking you to do is dig in it. And yeah, you're going to spend a lot of time digging and you get nothing but tired. But that one day, that one day, that one day, you get that little nugget. It's revelation to your heart. And like Jesus told Peter, Peter, upon that revelation of who I am, I'm going to build my church. Wow. But you're not going to get it if you don't get discipled. And you've got to stay with this and stay with it. See, I'm basically here to keep doing this. 
<laughs> get up and quit whining and crying and get your butt out of that chair and get out and get going. That's making disciples. I did that to my three children, and they're all independently wealthy, successful, got everything in the world going for them. And they said, Dad, just doing what you taught us. Now I'm doing it to you guys. But I can't do more than you're willing to receive. See, there has to be two anointings. There has to be the anointing on the saying, and there has to be an anointing on the hearing. And that's not taught either. And that comes from you guys. See, I do everything hardly as unto the Lord not unto man. I don't do this for you guys. You know why? Because I know you guys can disappoint me and let me down. Mm-hmm. And I won't. I, I, I'm not going to give you that freedom. I'm not going to give you that right. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to give you that part of my heart. Now, I'll love you and I, I'll, I'll do whatever, but the only person that has that special place in my heart is Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'll give you everything else. But you don't get that part. And you want to make a difference. And you want to change. I can give you help. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to help you. And is that not the role of the Holy Spirit? He's the helper. You know what that means? Paraclete, come alongside. one come alongside to help. Yes. That's what his job is. But if you don't use him, you don't step out in faith, you don't walk in faith, you don't try and do things, you know? This, this is one thing I can guarantee you guys. You're going to fail. But don't fall backwards. Fall forward. Yeah. I want to ask you Before. something. How many times, how many times did Thomas Edison try and make a light bulb? A lot. Over a hundred? A lot. <laughs> I, I know. I know. Two thousand times, yeah. and when it didn't work, he threw it in the corner. Try it again. George Washington Carver with the peanut. Those are great men. Mm-hmm. They're great men. You think Donald Trump's a great man? He's a great man. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you like him or not. I didn't ask anybody to like me. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. Yeah. And if that's not going to work, it's just not going to work. But I can't compromise it. That's how Donald Trump is. He knows what works. He made $6 billion. You think that's chump change? He knows what works. He knows he fails. But you know what else he knows? You fall forward. You don't fall back. You keep moving. But the first thing you got to realize is you got to try something. You got to do something. You got to step out. Do something that's bigger than you are. I didn't ask you to do something based on, well, wait a minute, I want to go look at my checkbook. I'm talking about, and that's what we're going to discuss here. I'm talking about having a vision and a dream. 
And this is what God said. This is the foundation of our teaching. The sower soweth the word. What is that supposed to mean? Uh, Mark, does the Bible say that I will bless the work of your hands? That's what I mean. God, God blesses the work of our hands. You want to know what that is? What's a seed? So that's it's his word. You sow that word in your heart. And the first thing that's gonna happen is the devil's gonna come. Get ahead of myself here a little bit. Mark 4, 15. It says, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, which you just did, Satan comes immediately. To steal the word of the son. We're dealing with the scripture in Mark chapter 20, uh, 11, 24. And this, this is the foundation of all this teaching we're, that I will be doing. Therefore, I say, that's the planting. You have to say it. You've got to use your tongue. You've got to get your mouth involved with what you're doing. And I know it doesn't feel good. Okay, when you go to a new job, it doesn't feel good. It's like you got to get through this thing and you got to get yourself into a habit. Bad deal. Because what you end up doing with your habit is you develop a normal. Mm -hmm. And that normal doesn't let you go any farther. You just get in the habit and you just expect this is what it's going to be and I guess this is the way it is. But if you can get your tongue working on, in, in, in the Word of God and you can plant this seed, I say, therefore I say unto you. Four steps. Whatsoever things you desire, delight yourself. Desire. Pray. Believe, receive. And we're going to go through all those. Not tonight. I was studying this this morning and this afternoon, and I realized, and I made this comment in this room before, that 95% of all businesses uh, fail in the first five years. I think it's higher than that. 95. That's just the seed time part. Because the devil doesn't want you to get beyond that desire. He wants it quelched there. He wants it stopped at the desire. And that's where most people stop. They start it, they get excited about it, they may even write it down. They may know that God says so, oh, but then doubt comes in. What is that? Mark 4.14. Mark 4.15. Satan comes immediately. And taketh away the word that was sown. See what I was digging for when I was 28? This is stuff I was digging for. But I didn't know I could believe it. I didn't know that I could trust in it. Nobody ever told me anything about that. So I didn't know. I just knew what all the people had said. All the people in my past. 
I had to break away from all that. It wasn't easy. Now I got those friends that got that garbage going on, and I got this stuff going on. I got these bad habits. You got to watch television all the time, and you know, and you got to do yada 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 all these, all that past stuff. I'm not against watching television. I'm against you getting in a habit and it controlling you, and when and when it gets stuck in your mind, it gets down into your heart. There's times I'll, I'll watch a movie, I'll just sit down, you know, maybe a Friday night, I'll sit down and watch a movie, and I don't know really what's in it, maybe I know one of the actors and I happen to like him or something, and next thing you know, there's stuff going on there, it's like, what am I doing? I mean, I grab my thing and I shut it off. It may take me a day to get that out of my system. Stuff I, sh I, didn't, I didn't want to watch, but it's all of a sudden it's in my face. Now, I'm going to give you one other one. I can give you a bunch of them. I'm going to give you one of them. You know, when you're watching those TV commercials, and it says this zippity doo dah drug, <laughs> this thing will fix your broken elbow, but it's going to kill your liver. It's going to your right foot's going to fall off. You know, your ear, you're going to go deaf, and you probably won't get to see much very much longer. But you know, it'll fix your elbow. You need to buy this drug. When I got that going on, if, I mean, I'm, I'm, I may be watching something real basic, and they got this drug commercial on. It seemed like about every other commercial is a drug commercial about some stupid thing it does. And you know what? I don't want to hear it, because it isn't where I want to go. It isn't what I'm believing. You want to believe that? Fine. The problem with believing that is it'll only take you so far, and then you're a dead-end street. And now what are you going to do? Because now you got something in your body that nobody can fix. And all you did is all your life you had trusting in those drugs you've been popping. And doctors you've been going to. See, I don't want to do that. that. Back there. I don't want anything to do with it. And when I hear that, I just, I'll just plug my ears like this and I'll start praying in tongues. And I'll either shut the thing off because I don't want to watch any more of it, or if I want to finish watching the silly thing, I'll just plug my ears until I see that go away, and then I'll, then I'll just say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Jesus, I just praise you and thank you. You're the Lord God that healeth me. You watch over me. Yes. You take care of me. I mean, I've been, I've been writing for how many weeks? Ten weeks now, I've been writing about the Psalm 91. I've had people say, how in the world did you get so much to say? I said, I don't. You're getting it from the Holy Spirit. So I'd highly recommend you listen to it. Yeah, there may be stuff in there that don't mean much to you, but there's going to be stuff in there that's going to mean, really say something. Because you'll run into that treasure. And all you got to do is dig that sucker up and grab a hold of it and take it home and open it up and enjoy the goodness. That's the treasure. And so, we know that God says that the kingdom of God is the key to this whole thing. See, the kingdom is where everything's at. Everything you ever need, everything you ever dream about, everything you ever desire, everything you've ever hoped for, every relationship you want to be totally healed and totally whole. Everything that's good, everything that's lovely and honest and just and pure and true and of a good report, it's in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. yes. What's exciting, though, is it's in you. I'm just going to throw something out here, and I will tell you, even though I'm pretty good at math, 
I really don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll just say it. 99% of the people go to the grave and have never, ever tapped into it that are born again. Because they can't fathom it. You ask me, does, does, did, did the Holy Spirit come to you and does he live inside you? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what are you doing with it? Well, well, I don't know. What do you mean, what am I doing with it? I said, well, he's living inside you, aren't he? Oh, yeah. I said, well, I read the Genesis, right? It's the Holy Spirit that created the universe. And he's living inside of you. Wow, I guess I never thought about that. Well, yeah. Well, I, yeah, okay. Walk away. Not get it at all. Born again. And just walk away. Totally ignorant. Totally out of it. Not understand a single thing that was said. And the sad part of it is, is they're not hungry to know. Because they reached the normal. And they've been dead in the water since that day. And sometimes it's been 60, 80 years. Because God promised you that there is nothing impossible to him who believes. That means that every vision, every dream, every goal that you set for yourself. Remember, desire. Desire. And part of that desire is delighting yourself. That's part of that desire. That's under that, that heading. It's real. But you have to believe it. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God is real. But you have to believe it. You have to get your mind renewed. You've got to allow it to come out of you self. And if your mind has been watching as the stomach turns and all that garbage and all the monkey business on television and you've been listening to all your buddies talking about that, you know, nothing ever works for them and everything fails that I try and, uh, you know, and uh, somewhere along the line, I hope like I, I spend enough money on lottery tickets, I might make, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll hit it. And I say, well, you got a better way than that. Well, what's that? God? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. God, huh? Yeah, yeah, God, God. That's a better way. If you engage him. But remember, it's a process. And if you fail at any step in that process, you're done. Not forever. You're just going to have to start over again or get that thing going back where you were if you got the opportunity, but never quit. I've had people ask me, well, how long do you, how long do you wait till, till God answers your prayer? And I said, for the rest of my life. Man, I don't know if I want to wait that long. Well, then you're not, you're not interested. You're not interested in God and, and His blessing. Well, no, I'm interested in God. Well, no, that's how it works. They're in, they're in, they're in the, uh, plan B. God doesn't have any plan Bs. He said, let your yes be yes and your no be no, and anything other than that comes from any one. Well, what, where's plan B at in that? Unless you consider plan B is... Plan A is winning and plan B is failing, but I don't see that as plan B. Plan, plan B would be something else in the win category, you know? Because we don't want to talk about that fail thing, but that's what, that's what it is. It's, it, there's only two things. There's two options. And God says it's all at your disposal. And we have to have a... An understanding, and this is really, once again something that I'm really learning right now. This is an area that I'm getting stuff out of. And that is what's inside of me and how do I get it out? Yeah. 
how do I, how do I get this thing to be benefit my family, to benefit me, to benefit my checkbook, to benefit my body, to benefit people around me? How do I get this thing out? And, and he says, it's real simple, son. Your body doesn't go anywhere, your mind doesn't tell it. When your mind shuts down, your body will fall to the floor. It's done. There may be those automatic things that happen in your brain, like it'll keep a heart pumping, you know, or uh, that kind of thing. But the body doesn't go anywhere, the mind doesn't tell it to. And see, the demons aren't allowed to do anything on this planet unless they have a body. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking about possessing you. Right. I'm not talking about demon possession. That's, a, that's just, that's a wild, wild child over here. I'm just talking about this thing I'm talking about. Satan comes immediately. What does he do if he gets that word stole, stolen? He's taking over your mind. That's your battleground. And it's the mind that allows the things in the spirit to come out through your body. Your spirit, man, is just like God. The power's there. Everything's there. Healing's there. Blessing is there. Finances is there. Wisdom is there. Christ has been made into us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Redemption, redemption is there. Sanctification is there. And I, I can't tell how many churches, oh, they're still trying to get sanctified. Another, oh, you know, we've been, re one day we'll get redeemed. I mean, we've got to, he'll come down and redeem us and pull up. I'm going... So I never understood any of that stuff because half the stuff is going to be for the future. And, now, yeah. and what God's saying to me, he told me, he said, son, you're already all that. You've already been redeemed. So if you got, if you got condemnation going on because of something you did in your past, then you've chosen to do that. Because God, God ain't in it. He didn't tell you to get redeemed. He is, see, he's a man of his word. That's the first thing we got to get straight in our minds. If there is a God... And he is what he says he is. He's a man of his word. He does just what he tells you he's going to do. Now that isn't how we do it. So we have a tendency to see God the way we are. Not the way he is. This is what he is. But if you don't read this thing, your mind's not going to get renewed and you're always going to be thinking wrong about God and that power that's inside of you to get done in this earth what he wants to get done with you. We've all been given that. We've all been given a gift, and maybe many, but he has something he wants to do with it. He has an accomplishment that he wants you to do. And it'll be all tied together with finance and business and ministry, and it's all kind of tied together. That's what he's shown me. You know, they're in the ministry in this country that has been half its time trying to uh, collect funds. Running a, they run a business. They may not see it exactly that way, but it's a business. Sure. Yeah. Just as much as whatever it is I do here and however we do it. But there's something that's special that God did on the inside, and it's just something... See, I spent a lot of my years since that 28th birthday waiting on God to come and do something. I spent a lot of my time doing that. But he told me, he said, I'm not going to do it. I've already done everything I'm going to do. Right. And I gave it to my son. He paid the price so that I can give it to you. All power and all authority has been given to me, Jesus said. And I am giving it to you. Go make disciples. 
lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. If you eat any deadly thing, it won't hurt you. Whatever you do, I am the Lord God, and I will always cause you to triumph in Christ Jesus. Whatever it is. But you have to believe this. And you have to believe that it's coming out of you. This isn't tricky-dicky religious, some kind of a cult. This is the reality of what happened when Jesus paid the price. Yes. And, and when he died, he went into the ground and his seed died. And when he came out of that ground, his seed, the Holy Spirit and the power and the authority and everything that's good, he'd give to his disciples. He breathed on them. Receive me, the Holy Ghost. And from then on, man, it was rolling. But we've missed it somewhere along the line. We've lost our way. When I see this country doing some of the things it's doing, and I hear some of the idiot politicians, I'm, I'm, I'm like, how in the world do those... Those people are so stupid. I, I'm surprised they know how to go to the bathroom. I mean, I listen to them talk, and it's like this is this is how far our country's come. And they think they they just you know why they want to get rid of Trump because they don't want to lose all the all the groundwork they they've laid. They said, right. well, you know what that is? They don't. Worst thing they want is they want you to stop abortion. They said, we knew when that last Supreme Court judge got in, we had the possibilities of losing Roe v. Wade. I'm going, that's what that's all, this is all about? Yeah. L losing Roe v. Wade? Yeah. About the immorality and all the, all the do-nothings that they, they, they want to keep giving do-nothings to? It, it's, it's staggering where these people have come. And you know the worst part of it all is where the church is at. Yeah. The church is following half of those people. Well, you know, I mean, they just. And, 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 they, and it's like I did a posting on that this morning, but you won't see it for two weeks. They, they, they feel that they're doing right. It's all prophesied. What's in, in the latter days, what's wrong is right, and what's right is wrong. Because they don't use the Word of God as, a, as their foundation. You know, Jesus gives that story. He said, don't build a house on the sand. Why? Because when the storm comes, it'll blow it over. That's why he wants something there. Your normal will never be any higher and taller and stronger than that foundation you built. And that's this book here. That's the Word of God. And if you're out trying to do things, and that's what so many of these men do, they go out in the business and they try and build all these great empires. You know, the Warren Buffetts and the Bill Gates, they build their great big empires. I just hope they get saved because they're going to have a major, major problem. And you know what? The church can control them, at least where the church is concerned. Now, they can't say, well, he's going to go eat a Dairy Queen today. I'm talking about he's not going to. Bill Gates wants the whole nation to be taking a vaccine of which he owns the company. And then he also wants to put a chip under your heart, hand. You know why I want you to do that? It's just logical. It makes sense. If you think like most of these politicians that you listen to, it just makes sense. You know how they're going to do that? They're going to pass a law and say, you got to take that, and they're going to put that chip under your hand. 
This, and they can check you as to whether or not you, you got immune or you took that uh, vaccine. But that's just the first deceptive step. And once they get that chip under your hand, you're dead. You're dead meat, man. They're going to control you. You know, and, and one of the things I said, I hope you people are learning from this situation. Yeah. I hope you're learning from it. And I hope you're realizing, and you, you guys got yourself all caught up in all the gossip and all the social media stuff. And, and you know what? You're not learning nothing. You got to break from some of that garbage and you got to start getting into the word and you got to start finding out what the word has to say about this whole thing. And you got to start calling a horse a horse. That means if, if that, if the democratic party believes in abortion, the, the party is being controlled by demons, yes. doctrines of devils. Yes. Of course they would say, well, no, I don't believe that that's murder because that's just the flesh. They just, they, they've just done it for so long. They just, they, they think they're okay. And a lot of them go to church every Sunday. They make no bones about it. They go to church. They say the rosary or they pray a prayer, or the, whatever they do. They go. And, you know, Nancy Pelosi said, I'm praying for Donald Trump. That piece of crap, he's a blind dog. Well, if you're praying for him, why are you calling him those things? You, you, that's, that's hypocritical to be saying you're praying for somebody and then talk to him like he's a dog. That ain't right. If you're praying for somebody, that means whatever he is, he's going to change if you, if you think it's right to change. Because the, the real issue is if she'd start really truly praying from her heart, she'd get changed. So, we got, we've got, uh, let's see here. So James chapter 4, verse 7 in the Amplified says, So be subject to God, resist the devil, and that means to stand firm against him and say, Depart from me. And he will flee. Mm -hmm. Because there's only one person or being in this life that can stop you from accomplishing all of your dreams and goals. That's you. It's not the devil. And it's not God. You have to have a firm decision in your life. You have to believe with all that is within you that when God says something about you, that's what he means. Because the enemy is a great deceiver and he's going to come when you plant that seed, even with your saying. That's your desire. You're planting that seed He's going to come and he's going to sound so amazingly convincing that he will take the word of God and he will get you thinking about something that reverses what God said. The pure, childlike simplicity of the word. He will do away with it somehow. He will convince you that you're misreading it. You don't, must, must not understand it. That surely can't be the case because you're going to be tried when you step out and believe something, you're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. Okay? And it ain't God that's doing it. He said, thank God for the trials, but he didn't say he brought the trials. You're going to be tested. But Satan has no power, no authority over us. And most people if you've been living in fear from this coronavirus, Satan has control of you. Because mm -hmm. fear isn't from God. If you have fear, 
and it has affected you and it'll make you sick. It'll kill you. 